I went to Australia when I was a child, at age 12, to study, and I lived there for three years. And after I left, in fact, when I went back for a series of concerts and classes many years later, the, the teachers there were saying, you know, we have a fantastic young violinist here named Richard Tognetti. You should get to know him. <laughs> Next thing I knew, he took over the Australian Chamber Orchestra and started doing fantastic things with it. I went to hear them play um, at Carnegie Hall a few years ago, and I thought the performance was riveting. Um, it was a very unique style of, 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 of interpretation. It was, uh, you know, modern instruments, but when they play Mozart or Baroque music, it was very much in the Baroque or, or the early music performance style, and it was a very energetic approach very lively and um, clearly this, these musicians in the Australian Chamber, they take chances when they play, which I always admire. <laughs> I have to begin by asking you how you began working on the film Master and Commander. Well, um, interestingly, I met Russell Crowe in, in the mid-1990s in Carnegie Hall. <laughs> he came to a concert. He was already a well-known actor in Australia, but not a superstar in America. And he, having a very curious mind, came to the concert. We became friends, very good friends. And then when he accepted the role of uh, Captain Jack Aubrey, for Peter Weir's film master and commander, and you read the first book, you are confronted with music. They play music right from the beginning, the, the good doctor and, and the captain. And um, they play a Locatelli string quartet, which doesn't actually exist, or not that we could find anywhere um, in um, our research notes. And so um, Russell asked if, if I would be interested to teach him how to play the violin. At that m point in time, we weren't sure how much music or even what type of music was going to be featured in the film. And then I met Peter Weir, and interestingly, I met him in Costa Mesa. Yeah. <laughs> they were doing pre-production, and they were already, I think, living in San Diego or maybe already down at Fox Studios in just outside of Rosarito in Mexico. And, um, and then, just incrementally, my role became increasingly, you know, I, I suppose, important in, in um, the musical part of the film. Now, Peter Weir, the director, did you and he have conversations on what, what he wanted the score to sound like? Oh, yeah. I'm, I mean, Peter Weir, being one of the great directors on the planet, is um, unlike a lot of directors, you know, who just commission a composer to write two hours of film score and then you get a sound editor to ride the volume button. He, um, he's the musical director in a, as well, in a way, um, in choosing the music, um, defining the music, um, editing the music. I mean, everything he had a, a, an incredibly important um, role in, in, you know, all aspects of the film and most especially the music. And the music is the... The, well, the first thing he, th he had to think about with the performances of um, Jack Aubrey and Stephen, Dr. Stephen Maginan, and then um, the very last thing just about, because it's just about the last thing they put on. I was surprised by the, the score for Master and Commander because you expect an adventure sea film to have mm. this sort of soaring, yo-ho-ho -ho kind of a, a score, and that's not what greets you at all? No, well, he eschews a lot of um, Hollywood devices um, and, you know, the certain elements are trying to get him to do different things and to make as much money as possible and to have a, you know, a song at the end and a, you know, but I he, right from the start, didn't want to make a film like that. He wanted to take us into a very almost claustrophobic, you could say, or cloistered world of these men on a ship in, you know, the early part of the 19th century. And 
if you have a big rousing epic score, you lose the integrity that I think he was trying to to achieve the whole way. And and this is a man that sticks to his principles no matter how much money is at stake. And um, and so he wanted the music to, you know, underscore those elements in the film that were important to him. And um, and so that's what we were directed to do. Well, as you've mentioned, your friend Russell Crowe is, of course, the film star. And he, as Captain Jack Aubrey, plays the violin. We see him yes. play the violin in, in uh, the movie. You taught him how to do that, but how much were you actually able to teach him? Well, there were... In truth, there were th three of us uh, because it's a, it's a, you know, you don't learn it overnight. And I was with him for a couple of months, and then he had a couple of months with um, um, a very w well known mathematician, actually, who also plays the violin, um, and, and a, somebody else who, who helped. Um, you know, in the violin, he's, he said, was the hardest thing he's ever had to learn. And he set himself a very high bar and jumped over it. He wanted to be able to, to play um, every note that I was actually playing on the track mm -hmm. so that it wasn't just faking it. And, and he could. He could, you know, um, he could draw a bow over the string and make a fairly reasonable sound. And, you know, they say that kids learn really quickly. Well, I've never seen anything like this. It was quite astonishing. Yeah, he, he could actually play Waltzing Matilda so that people believed that he was a violinist. And, and he could play every note that I played. I mean, you know, I say more or less, but, um, you know, it was a, an incredible accomplishment. It, don't we actually see your hand in the film, though, at no. one point? Uh, no. No, it's all no, him. It's all him. And when there's um, a tricky passage that he couldn't, you know, play perfectly, then, of course, it cuts, you know, to the to the face. But no, it's all him actually imitating, um, yeah, the, the track. It's quite an accomplishment, albeit, you know, a small one in the film, but nevertheless an important one. Do you think uh, you might play something for us from Master and Commander? Yeah, of course. I mean, I can demonstrate the easiest I'd love you bit to. and the most effective bit and the most memorable in a way, which is at the end after they've been through all these um, battles and all this strife and, you know, ship, uh, masts breaking and so forth and death and um, th and then the, the best way to communicate is for them to play. And so they play this piece um, by Boccherini, um, which probably would have been well known at the time. We, that, that ties in with the authenticity of it. Um, yeah, we chose this piece and it's a pop song. If you're listening to this on the radio, you can't see that I'm playing this held like a guitar, as it states on the um, on the score. And he did this in the film, and it was it was a cool thing to do. And then over that, the cello has this melody, which I'll play for you. I guess we can call that the Baccarini duet from the film Master and Commander. Well, since you have the violin out and all warmed up, let's talk a little bit about mm -hmm. your violin. It's uh, a period instrument, uh, Guadagnini, is that correct? Guadagnini, yeah. <laughs> Tell yes. us a little bit about it. Well, it was made in 1759. There are probably four or five top Italian makers of, of um, stringed instruments. 
from the violin family um, that command very high prices. Of course, the most famous one is Stradivarius um, and the director of this um, festival, the great uh, Jimmy Lin. He plays on a Stradivarius at the moment. And then um, equally good, but not quite as well known, is uh, Del Gesù. And then you've got, um, let's say, the next rung is, is Guadagnini. And this is owned by an Australian bank. Um, and it's part of their fine arts collection. And I've got it, fortunately, on a semi-permanent loan. <laughs> now, what is it about per playing on a period instrument? Well, yeah, you use the word period instrument. It is from the period of, of, um, of the, well, the Baroque era. Um, this is being 1759 is, um, is uh, literally nine years after the uh, accepted end of the, the Baroque era. But, um, but we actually use the word period in a more specific sense, as in an instrument that is um, still in its original form or has been um, renovated, let's say, um, into, back into its original form. Because the, um, many things have changed in the setup of the violin to make it um, easier to project in the large concert halls of the modern era. Um, so the bridge is, is lighter in, as a period instrument and the fingerboard where you place your fingers is um, much shorter. And the strings are and different. And the strings are also gut and I actually play on a raw gut string. It's not cat gut anymore, it's sheep gut. But sometimes it sounds like cat gut, especially when it gets full of humidity. And, um, and so they were all uh, either cat gut or um, interestingly, in Venice, at the time of Vivaldi, there were silk strings, oh. and which gave quite a different sound. And also the pitch. The, this is an A, and it vibrates at 440 um, beats per second. And it, um, commonly, the pitch was lower as well. And so all these little things uh, um, changed the sound enormously. And so that, that's what we use the word period for when we talk about period instruments. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of you know, um, players who play modern music are playing instruments from the 18th century or before. Well, since the improvements uh, made to the violin since uh, the 1700s are supposed to make it better, what is the magic of, of these older violins? It's the perennial... Um, Forty billion dollar question because if you could a find the answer to it, you would be a, a billionaire. Um, look, even with nanotechnology, you can't replicate the mystery of a violin, and maybe that's just you know what this is a God fearing nation, and maybe it's in the hands of God. You know why a violin sounds like it does? It's they've analysed it. They every now and again someone has a eureka experience and they believe that they've come up with the magic ingredient, which was the volcanic ash in northern Italy at the time, found in the varnish. But then, you know, the re repose to that is, well, you know, a lot of these instruments have had their varnish worn, w worn, worn off, and the, the varnish isn't, um, isn't original. So there goes that theory. You know, the, the wood, the type of wood used, but they've analysed it so much you think they could replicate that. You think, you know, just they're, just they're with quite primitive tools compared to, as I say, the nanotechnology that they have today. You think with a computer they could replicate, you know, to the, you know, a nanometer, you know, every little part of the violin. But they just can't. They can't find that mystical, mythical ingredient that makes a violin, an old violin, so special and therefore so valuable. Do you know anything about the personal history of your violin? Unfortunately, I don't because it was bought um, through a dealer and the person that was selling it, maybe for tax reasons, <laughs> I don't know, um, it didn't want uh, their identity, uh, identity to be revealed. Yeah, so but one day I'm going to do some sleuth work and find out the It's part of the mystery. As well, correct, <laughs> correct.
let's move on to your um, your collaboration with pianist Angela Hewitt. Can, tell us about Angela. Well, she's Canadian. She's from Ottawa. Um, she, um, being a Bach specialist, um, is up there with, of course, another great Canadian um, who she probably wishes would go away for a while, being Glenn Gould. Um, she started climbing Mount Everest, the Mount Everest of, of keyboard, um, a few years ago, some, what, 10 or 15 years ago, um, and started recording all the solo works for keyboard by the great J.S. Bach. Once this was completed, she um, undertook the recording of all the keyboard concerti, and she, she'd been looking for a, um, an orchestra for a while. Indeed, I think she even began a, the recording project with a, a certain orchestra and stopped very close to the beginning because it wasn't working out. And then we um, did a tour together and got on very well. And, and um, Hyperion came out to Australia and we recorded, yeah, the nine keyboard concerti of Bach. One critic called your work with Angela Hewitt a uh, meeting of the minds. And I'm wondering, do you have similar intellectual interpretations of this music? Well, I mean, it, yeah, this is a really um, complex answer. I mean, how musicians actually communicate. If it were just an intellectual communication, then musicologists could, you know, make recordings. Um, it's... At the end of the day, it's a visceral one, uh, but at some point, um, discussions have to be undertaken and agreements have to be made. Um, hopefully, there are more agreements than disagreements on phrasing and balance and volume. Um, but, um, yeah, there, there's, there's got to be um, an acceptance of, of different wills um, of course, these being concerti, you know, Angela has spent years learning them um, and studying the scores and so forth. Two of them are, are actually violin concerti originally, yeah. The D major and the G minor originally, they, you know them as E major and A minor violin concerti. And, um, and you start playing, you get to know each other's personality because, of course, it's not just um, being a curator in a museum. You're, you're not just putting a frame on, on an artwork and hanging it in a museum and putting it in a context. It's much more than that with the interpretation of music. It's about the personal inv involvement. I'm very much an expressionist uh, or a belief in the expression of, of the individual that should come through in an interpretation. I'm not into, as it's called, objective analysis. And um, so when all the right stars are in place, then you get a good interpretation. Um, but at the end of the day, it needs to be a visceral one. It needs to be occurring in, in the gut. And, um, and this seems to happen. So the talk and so forth, that, that's just preparatory? Yes. I mean, it's part of the rehearsal process and part of understanding the score. And that's where musicology comes in. Because all we're left with, it's a bit like, you know, reading Shakespeare. Just the words on the page are almost meaningless unless you're able to put it into context, unless you're able to make it, um, for want of a better word, relevant, unless you're able to understand the history, what preceded it, what was going on at the time. But then, of course, in the case of Shakespeare, we have his six signatures. We're not even sure that he wrote it all. And it's very similar to Bach. You know, we don't know much about him. He, we travelled much more today, coming from Costa Mesa, than, um, than he travelled almost in his whole lifetime. Um, but, of course, his music has travelled much more. And what does that mean? Where does it take us? You know, all of these deeply philosophical questions, of course, are important. But at the end of the day, just, you know, finding the, the structure of the music viscerally is, is, is paramount to a good interpretation. 
but of course the more intellectual vigour you can have to substantiate your um, theoretical claims and, um, and feelings, the better. Word more uh, about cl the classical standards, if you will. Uh, there's a lot of new contemporary music this year at Summerfest. I know that you work a lot with contemporary music, but the program uh, for uh, the Australian Chamber Orchestra is Bach, Vivaldi, classical standards. Yeah. Is it a challenge to keep those oldies fresh? <laughs> oh, look, this is a perennial question. I mean, this is why, in many respects, classical art is dying, because People um, are hooked on tradition and think that they have found the way to play things and that if they go from this line that, you know, the traditions will collapse. But, you know, I hasten to remind ourselves that um, these traditions have only often built up over 50 years, but you somehow think, oh, it's connected all the way back to Beethoven. I mean, we've been performing a very controversial piece, an arrangement I made of the Kreutzer Sonata originally for violin and piano, for strings and violin. And I hold that the way in which a violinist played back in Beethoven's time was so different to the modern violinist that if you even try to emulate it, you'll be lambasted. And I think it's much more like a gypsy violinist than um, much rougher hewn. Um, playing on gut strings for a start makes it a much more precarious instrument. And, but once you start doing this, you know, the, the mannerisms, let's say, of, of, of Beethoven that we know, the, the way in which he played, he was like crouching on the floor, he was knocking candelabra open, people were laughing at him, you know, they were booing him whilst he was playing. And now, of course, we sit in a reverential silence thing that Beethoven should be played all mezzo forte and, you know, with a lovely lush sound and, you know, a velvet Rolls Royce kind of orchestra with a pristine conductor standing in tails and we're all sitting there in the audience, you know, clapping only at the end and no one dares cough. How different is that from the original, I ask you? And so, yeah, I think that that's what keeping music alive is about, actually, you know, just being fresh. And as Clint Eastwood's father told him, you either, you know, progress or you decay. You either evolve or you stagnate. And um, it's true. It's, it's absolutely true. And, and if we just play the classics in the same way as the you know, previous incumbent played them, but you just pl try to play it a bit faster, a bit more perfect, it, 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 it'll stagnate. You have arranged a Ravel piece. As written, the Ravel's quartet in F is for four instruments. You've written an arrangement for the entire Australian Chamber Orchestra. How challenging is it to arrange something like that when it starts as a quartet? Oh, it depends. I mean, look, it's challenging. and uh, uh, To arrange a quartet is only challenging in the sense that um, one is always scared that, you know, being provocative, by being provocative, you're changing, altering, you know, the Mona Lisa, you know. But it's not a deconstruction for a start. Um, it's not a reinterpretation. It's a transcription. And... There's a history of it, you know. I mean, Chopin first heard uh, Beethoven's Quartet, Opus 131, played by some 50 musicians in um, in Paris, and was overwhelmed by it. Um, Mahler, of course, as we know, um, arranged a number of Beethoven string quartets, and I often do a bit of an experiment when we play a Beethoven string quartet. If I say it's arranged by Mahler, and all he did was add the um, bass, double bass, and change a few dynamics and phrasing things, whereas I do quite a bit more. Um, 
it's, it's accepted as you know, part of the canon, the great canon. If I say that I've arranged it, they say, oh, well, you know, <laughs> you should get a great composer to do it. And, and, um, and so sometimes I'm tempted to, you know, do a bit of a sleight of hand. But I have to stick with what, what I do and what I believe in. And the thing is that I've got a great example um, that is a running um, battle at the moment. Um, and it brings into question all sorts of things, especially estates. Now, um, Bartok uh, Fourth String Quartet, we found evidence to suggest, or even stronger than suggest, um, that Bartok himself was going to arrange his fourth string quartet and turn it into a string symphony or, or a string sonata, as is o um, often the term used. Um, but he didn't complete it. He ran out of time. So um, we thought, well, we'd do it. I thought, well, I'll, I'll do it. I'll give it a go. And luckily in Australia, it used to be 50 years. It's about to change, and copyright's going to be 75 years to be in line with um, Europe and the United States. So we were able to do it from 1995 onwards. Um, Bartok died in 45, so that's 50 years. And, and uh, I took a long time to do it. Um, there's a lot of solo and quartet and, um, and utilising the double bass and so forth. And we presented in a concert and it w felt fantastic. It felt like we had a new work in the repertoire. Um, we put it forward in touring programs and we were told that we couldn't because of the copyright. We wrote to Peter Bartok, the son, and after two long years we got a response saying no, no one is allowed to touch his father's works. And my response, at least tacitly, is, well, look, you know, you can't legislate against bad performances. So you shouldn't legislate against, you know, people, you know, doing this to, to, to the music. And also my other response is, well, Shakespeare and Renoir um, haven't suffered from a lack of estate, you know, and it doesn't really protect the integrity of the music. People will do what they need to do. Um, what I, my argument is that, A, it extends the repertoire. You name string works from the 19th and 20th century, and you haven't got that many. Actually, you haven't got more than you have got digits on your body, really. And, um, and also it keeps these works alive. I mean, I don't know how many of your listeners have heard the great Bernstein recording. And in fact, Bernstein, I think, might have said himself that his greatest accomplishment as a conductor um, was Beethoven Quartet, Opus 131, in an arrangement by Dmitri Metropolis um, with the Vienna Philharmonic. You know, and, you know, and it's really a very bloated, it's one of my favourite recordings, but the sound is very bloated. It sounds like, you know, a quartet, not just on steroids, but, you know, f on, a, on a different universe. And, and it changes, yeah, the, the way in which you look, look at a work. And so, yeah, A, it expands the repertoire, and B, it... Um, it gives us a different way of looking at something. There are two questions that come to mind after, after you're outlining the reasons that you work with these pieces that are not originally for a chamber orchestra. One is, you say it doesn't affect the integrity of the work, but some purists would say it does. Oh, well, of, course, of course they do, because it's for a quartet. But I've got a good example of this as well. Um, um, a very important concert hall in Europe, um, the, um, director was inviting us back and he said, but, you know, I don't want your, the arrangements of those quartets that you make because it's, you know, ruining the integrity of the <laughs> works and so forth. I said, okay, well, what would you suggest? Dvorak serenade again, Tchaikovsky serenade, you know, um, what else, you know, Bartok divertimento? How, you know, there aren't many works and this is my point. And, and he said, no, no, well, how about that wonderful string symphony, chamber symphony, um, of Shostakovich, and I said, well, there you go. It's an arrangement of a quartet, but you know it as an original work because of its title. And, um, and it's because people know the Ravel String Quartet as a quartet that they are perhaps prejudiced against, you know, hearing this. But as I stick to my point, you know, it's um, a perfectly valid way of extending the repertoire and of looking at these works afresh. Uh, the second question is, you, you mentioned estates. The second question is, who does 
own the music? Uh, I guess it's a legal question, but it's also sort of a, an aesthetic one. Um, if, if it's not an estate, aesthetically we own it. The, you know, we all own it. We all own Shakespeare. We can do what we want with it. You know, I mean, you know, look at Romeo and Juliet of, of Baz Luhrmann. You know, it's, it's whether you like it or not, it's a, it's, a, it's a valid way of expressing ourselves through the world of Shakespeare. And, um, you know, I, I mean, this thing called artistic integrity is such a, a difficult thing. It's like talking about auth authenticity and the, and the like. And um, let people go to town on things. Let, let them Im imbue, you know, these great, great masterworks with, with different interpretations. You know, it, we're recreative artists and, and we should be allowed to, to explore you know, and people say, oh, it doesn't need it. But you say, well, it sure does need it when, you know, you're a chamber orchestra and, and we want to explore this repertoire. And also there, there, are, there, are, there are another few reasons as well. One being that halls are so big, you know, and a quartet with four little voices, uh, you know, are lost. And so in a way it's a certain amplification. I'm, and I'm all for amplifying stringed instruments because that's what a CD does. When you listen to a CD, you're listening to an amplified instrument. So when you first started just trying to expand the chamber orchestra repertoire, did you expect all of this legal problem? Um, no, no. And actually working on Master and Commander, I learned a lot about the, um, the maze of, of uh, you know, the, the legal ramifications of doing something wrong. It, are an absolutely enormous. So, so we're very careful. I don't think we've made many mistakes. We can't perform Bella Bartok's Four String Quartet, unfortunately, um, in this country. But, um, but Peter Bartok did allow me to make an arrangement of, of his father's folk songs for Dawn Upshaw and the orchestra when we last performed in the US. But you see, there you go. You see, they're folk songs. So Bella Bartok had taken somebody else's material and made an arrangement himself for piano and voice. So everybody's you know, doing it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we were talking earlier about the old favorites of classical music, and your show tonight, your program tonight, is uh, heavily uh, Brahms and Bach. And so we were going to ask you if you would give us a performance of something from Bach right now. Absolutely, with pleasure. Um, so this is um, the Saraband from. Um, the D minor um, partita um, for solo violin. Do you mind if I tune a bit? <laughs>
That was the Saraband from the D minor Partita by J.S. Bach, performed by Richard Tonietti. We are speaking with violinist Richard Tonietti aboard the HMS Berkeley, the San Diego Maritime Museum. You can really hear that wonderful raw sound with these instruments. It's just, it's, it's so fabulous to hear it. Uh, it. It makes such a difference. Wood and cat gut, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, of course, we noticed that you stood up while you played that. In yeah. fact, all the ACO uh, musicians stand when they play. Can you tell us why? Correct, except the cellos. Um, ah, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. Um, well, look, it's, you know, when you play solo, you, you stand as a violinist, if you can, and, or a violist, and it's just freer and easier and saves money because you don't have to buy chairs and... <laughs> and it also, you, you can be closer to your colleagues. Um, you know, chairs um, create distance, and the closer musicians are playing together, um, mostly, the, the, the better it is for cohesion in ensemble and intonation. Um, and it's just freer, yeah, and easier and better for you. I mean, it's better if the human being stands, you know, at work as well, as we know. And so, yeah, that's, they're the reasons. Is sitting down playing classical music just another one of those stodgy old habits you want to well, overturn? <laughs> well, I don't just want to, you know, gratuitously overturn <laughs> habits. I mean, no, and, you know, there are plenty of great jazz musicians that sit to play as well. You know, no, it's just that we enjoy standing. It's just freer and seems to create a, a better sound for us. You think you'll feel that way in 20 years? <laughs> um, I hope so. Okay. I, I hope so. <laughs> I think Americans who love the arts are always envious of the support other countries give to their artists. Does Australia score high marks in its support of concert music? Well, I mean, the grass is always greener. I mean, most countries are envious of the states because of your th philanthropy. I mean, yeah. just being up at Costa Mesa, you know, they raised, I can't remember his name, but the guy that owns a lot of land up there and malls and so forth, and he built his own, you know, performing arts centre and, um, you know, raised um, $200 million, you know, I, US dollars, of course, for us, <laughs> that's a lot of money. And, um, you know, that, that's unheard of in a, in a government-funded, you know, country. We sit somewhere in between. Um, so we can still go to gov begging to government for support, but we don't have this kind of philanthropy. May, uh, well, two reasons. One being that we don't have the history of it, and two being we don't have the money. <laughs> I mean, not that we're a poor country. There's absolutely no complaints. But, um, but you know, I'm in America being the wealthiest country on earth, and so it should support the arts. And this is why America is an amazing country culturally, because of the Melons and the Carnegies and this man up in Costa Mesa, you know, and, and the ability to build Disney Hall and you know, redo MoMA in New York and so forth. It keeps cultures alive, you know. It's why people travel to s look at buildings and artifacts and endeavours of great human beings. If you can't get it one way, you get it the other, right? Correct. Yeah, although, I mean, governments, you know, are much... It's harder to get money out of them and strings are attached. And as we know, you know, they tried to... Jesse Helms tried to stop Robert Maplethorpe you know, exhibition, which is just ridiculous. So it's better to say, well, forget government support and just, you know, use private endowments, you know, where you don't have these strings attached. And normally they have, the individuals have a greater love for the arts than the individuals making, pulling the strings in government. I want to change the subject for a moment. Richard, I hear that you are an avid surfer. Correct, yeah. Have you surfed in San Diego? Um, Look, I, I almost surfed in San Diego, but I, I actually got sick. And I went to visit a friend of, uh, a, a very close friend of, of a very close friend of mine, um, a guy called, who's very well known here called Skip Fry for making surfboards. And one of my surfboards is modeled on, on his design, who creates the fish. And I realize now that he's actually incredibly famous here because he's married to the Woman um, who would woman, be mayor. Uh, woman who would be mayor. So I almost <laughs> surfed here, but I surfed in um, Mexico just d down the road in Baja because that's where Master and Commander was filmed and we were very lucky that we had an apartment just overlooking the, um, one of the great surf spots on earth, actually. Yeah. So you're not one of those musicians who are deathly afraid of 
injuring yourself by doing anything risky. Well, I am, but it doesn't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> the most, look, it, surfing, you know, is, the water's soft. <laughs> Occasionally you can hit the reef if you're surfing a coral reef, but the, probably the most dangerous thing I do, touch wood, is, um, is skiing, and I really push myself hard. Skiing. In Water U skiing? Utah. No, no, no. Snow skiing. Snow skiing. Like in Utah. And, and, um, but surfing is a, is a real love of mine. I, I think it's the sport that sits somewhere between, uh, well, it's the, the way in which humans move in this bizarre way, you know, and if you analyse it, it's very bizarre, taking a piece of fibreglass and foam and putting it in the water and taking off on a wave. But it's, it's somehow almost an artistic endeavour. Certainly the photos that they take of great surfers are, you know, they're art photos. They're incredible. And you're now going to be scoring an extreme surfing movie? Correct. Um, a, a, a friend of mine, Tom Carroll, who's a world champion surfer, four times world champion, I think he was, um, is, you know, astonishing uh, little nugget of a man who's uh, aged over 40, and there he is making an extreme surfing film off, off um, um, the coast of South Africa, southernmost tip of South Africa. And in order to, you know, because localism and surfing is quite an important thing, you know, as you'd know around this area especially. And, um, and so to get to know the locals, they lowered the surfers um, Ross Clark Jones and Tom Carroll and a Californian guy called Peter Mel and a couple of others into some shark cages <laughs> and lowered them down to get to know the locals. <laughs> so they said hi to the great whites that they were sharing the water with and then they pulled the cages up and they were surfing these 40 foot waves and Tom has come to a couple of our concerts and loves music and so he asked if I'd uh, lend an ear to his film. So that's what they mean by extreme. Oh, look, it, 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 it horrifies me. <laughs> Richard Tonyanis, thank you so much for joining Absolute us today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.